In this lecture, we'll be looking at a policy initiative during the Vietnam War known as the Strategic Hamlets Program, which was an attempt by U.S. military planners to create secure villages and relocate peasants away from areas that were under the influence of the Viet Cong. In the process of strengthening his regime, Diem began to face new problems with insurgencies throughout South Vietnam. Rural regions provided especially strong bases for Viet Cong activity. Diem and his advisors drew upon British and French colonial history in their development of the concept of agrovilles, which were farm communities intended mainly to separate rural peasant communities from communist insurgents and political cadres. The first agrovilles appeared in 1959 in South Vietnam. The image on this slide is from 1961 and it depicts an agroville in the Mekong Delta. This is another image depicting the Ba Te agroville from 1961 which was located west of Saigon. This photograph shows the entrance to the community which is guarded and has a moat around the perimeter. GM and his advisors initially uh, planned to build 80 of these agrovilles. Peasants were required to enter and exit the agroville through checkpoints, guarded checkpoints. Agroville residents would then be expected to return to the agroville each night after working in the rice fields. The agroville system proved to be a failure and only 23 of the 80 were built before GM abandoned the program. Peasants assigned to an agroville were relocated from their home villages. Most of them had never spent much time away from the villages um, in which they grew up and in which their families came from. Most rural peasants also followed the practice of ancestor veneration whereby a family's ancestors were regularly honored with rituals. Sometimes in the West, I should add, uh, this is mistaken for ancestor worship, but this is this is an inaccurate statement. The practice is closer, I'd say, to uh, placing flowers at the burial site of a relative or perhaps a flag, as we do on certain holidays. Uh, being relocated far from ancestral graves was a very significant uh, cultural disruption um, and also a spiritual disruption in the lives of peasants. Uh, most peasants believed that the traditional ways of life had been unjustly disrupted and for reasons they couldn't understand. Even worse, many more peasants would be used sometimes to construct an agroville than could possibly live there. In one example, 20,000 peasants were forced to build an agroville that could only hold 6,000 inhabitants, meaning that 14,000 people uh, essentially worked for free and neglected their own crops. This bred resentment and destroyed any goodwill the GM regime might have gained from these agrovilles. However, the failure of the Agriville program did not deter the United States from seizing on the idea and transforming it. The Strategic Hamlet program consisted of villages combined and redesigned to produce a secure perimeter, as you see in this image. The peasants received weapons and they were taught self-defense tactics. American planners believed that the Strategic Hamlets would eventually function as parts of a vast network. The initial hamlets would be built in areas with limited or no insurgent activity and new hamlets would be added over time to build a network of linked villages. American officials also believed that hamlets could be used to introduce reforms, social and political, and to improve the lives of peasants. This is an aerial view of a strategic hamlet on the slide. Note the extensive wall systems and uh, fortification elements in the design. By 1962, over 600 strategic hamlets had been built. One of the principal goals for the U.S. of the strategic hamlet program had a distinct military component. One tactic of Viet Cong insurgents was to insinuate themselves into local villages, which made it difficult for the ARVN to identify the enemy. American military planners believed that strategic hamlets would deny the Viet Cong rural bases from which to operate, as well as to make it easier to locate and attack insurgents. American officials also believed that the strategic hamlet program would help the Diem regime with one of his most glaring weaknesses, which was an almost uh, total lack of support among rural peasants, uh, 
particularly in the Mekong Delta and in the Central Highlands. This image from 1962 is of the fortified hamlet known as Gu Chi in South Vietnam. In the image, a South Vietnamese ARVN soldier patrols along a sharpened bamboo fence surrounding the hamlet. While many of these hamlets were secure, at least initially, many residents felt isolated. In some cases, uh, the government removal agents to show that uh, returning to the home villages was no longer an option actually burned the vacated houses as the villagers left their original homes. To help convince peasants to relocate to strategic hamlets, intense propaganda needed to be developed and implemented. Many peasants were highly reluctant to leave their ancestral villages. Some had to be forcibly relocated. This leaflet suggests uh, that violence awaited those who did not heed the call to move. The first part read, to protect your lives and properties, you must move immediately and resettle in new life hamlets in the secure areas of Benkao, Kanjang, and Ben Kyo. Your present hamlets will be bombed and fired on every night to destroy Viet Cong installations in your area. The same leaflet also extolled the virtues of relocating to a strategic hamlet, as you can see in the uh, idyllic image here. The government of Vietnam regrets that you have to leave your rice fields and gardens and therefore you will be allowed, if requests are submitted to the district chief, to return to your homes and work on your rice fields and gardens, take care of your property, and return to the new location at night. There are many reasons why the strategic hamlet program failed. As mentioned earlier, pe peasants resented being relocated from their homes. Many of the hamlets, in addition, were not adequately defended. Uh, by mid-1962, the Viet Cong was successfully infiltrating many hamlets. Moreover, the hamlets that insurgents could not infiltrate, they simply turned into military targets, which makes it easy to identify, as you can see in this image here. Uh, the U.S. provided millions of dollars in direct subsidies for the hamlets, but much of the aid was siphoned off by corrupt South Vietnamese officials. The promised benefits of living in a hamlet really didn't materialize for many residents. Many villagers, um, in addition, were not compensated for the lands they left behind, which ended up worsening their economic situation. Um, critics maintained that the hamlets were more like concentration camps than real communities, as the accompanying photograph seems to suggest. The irony of the similarities between strategic hamlets and concentration camps was not lost on propagandists for the National Liberation Front. This NLF poster associates the hamlets with American imperialism and prisons. You can see the barbed wire. If you look, you can see guard towers and, uh, of course, the, uh, the helmet and the bayonet of the American military. However, the most important reason for the failure of the strategic hamlet program simply was the Jim regime itself. Jim and his brother Nhu viewed the strategic hamlet system as a way to sort of control the peasants, as opposed to a system that offered an incentive to peasants to support the government. Strategic hamlets were in large measure centers of indoctrination and coercion, as opposed to programs designed to improve the well-being of peasants, despite uh, the original intent of the American military planners to make these as centers of reform and uh, to improve the lives of peasants. This brings to a close our brief look at the Strategic Hamlet program.